there's a lot of elements to the gig economy. And some people think of it strictly as, hey, you can drive for Uber or do Airbnb. And those that's one part of it. And I know a lot of people that while they do their full-time job, they're doing driving for Uber on the side. You're listening to Steve Roller, fellow writer, business builder, and founder of the Cafe Writer Community. Steve has some great insights into the gig economy, an area poised for rapid growth as more people than ever before now work from home. And you're about to learn how and why to take advantage of it because Steve is today's guest on Solopreneur Success. Welcome to the Solopreneur Success Podcast, where successful business owners gather to share true stories and sound advice to help you start and grow your own solopreneur business. Come soar with us and design the life you love. Now, here's your host, Steve Combs. Hello, solopreneurs. Today, I'm happy to bring you my friend, Steve Roller, who I met several years ago at a writing conference. But Steve isn't just a fellow writer. He's a longtime successful business owner, a world traveler, founder of the popular online community, Kathy Writer, and a lot more. And today we're going to talk about some of those things. And one big thing we're going to talk about today is that term freelancing, the gig economy, how to ensure your business stands out in a crowded marketplace. And we have a lot to cover today. So Steve, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me, Steve. I'm really glad to be here and look forward to sharing some ideas with your audience. I'm looking forward to, especially after reading your book, The Freelancer Manifesto. And then I have to laugh because despite the title, you say you hate the word freelancer. And, and what you said about the word freelancer, I have to completely agree with. So I would love if you'd share with our listeners, why is it that freelancer is such a poor choice for occupation title? Yeah, well, I did name my book The Freelancer Manifesto because it is a commonly used term, and I think everybody understands what it is, and it does apply to the gig economy. But a couple of reasons why I don't particularly like it, Steve. One, I think it's kind of overused, for one. But to me, it's the antithesis of building a business. To me, it implies the idea that you're kind of flitting about from gig to gig and job to job and basically taking whatever comes your way. And I don't think that clients and customers take it real seriously when you call yourself a freelancer. And I actually don't think it's necessary. So a lot of people call themselves a freelance writer, a freelance copywriter, freelance graphic designer, whatever it might be. But really, you don't need that prefix freelancer in front of whatever your title is. So you can just be a copywriter, be a content writer, be a writer, whatever it is. So I don't think it's necessary. But more than anything, I just think it implies a lack of structure and a lack of organization. Real business people have a little bit more structure to their business. And I'll talk about this a little bit later, probably. But I like the idea of the concept of building a business and bringing people into your world, whereas freelancing kind of conveys the idea that you're adapting and and reacting to whatever is out there in the marketplace and that you'll take whatever comes your way. So I could go into it more and I will go into it a little bit more later, but those are kind of the, some of the main reasons why I'm not real fond of the word freelancer. Yeah, I get it. And you want to be in the driver's seat. It's your business, not somebody else's business. You're not an employee. That's why you started a business. And we're going to talk, I'm sure, about some of the benefits of owning your own business. But you've been doing this for a long time. You started your first business back when you were in college. I'd love to hear about what did you do? How did that get started? What did that result in for you? Yeah. So when I was in college, I had the opportunity to work with a company called Southwestern Advantage. And it really involved going to another part of the country for the summer. So between semesters in college in the summer, I worked with this organization. It was a sales organization. We sold educational books and we went to a very intense sales training in Nashville at the corporate headquarters and they trained us. And then we went out to a different part of the country. And I did this every summer during college. And I learned how to not only sell products, but I learned how to sell myself and my ideas. And that's a super valuable skill. So essentially, I was running my own business. We were independent contractors. We had to set up our own home base. We paid our own taxes. We were not W-2 employees. So it really essentially was running your own business. And this was back in the late 80s. And back then, I made some pretty good money, enough to pay for school by myself, and gained some valuable skills. One summer, I actually made $20,000 in 12 weeks. So for a college student in those days, that was pretty good money. But more important than 
any of the money that I made, which was all spent in the next few years after that, like I said, I really learned how to sell myself and sell my ideas. And that has been an invaluable skill that I've used over and over throughout my career in corporate sales with a couple of publishing companies after that, and in my career as a copywriter, and now in my role as community builder and a coach. So it's been a probably the most valuable skill I've ever learned was selling. Right, which is really the skill of persuasion. And that is, any is. business owner needs persuasion. Yes, absolutely. Now, I know that many people listening to this probably haven't even started their own business yet, or maybe they're just getting off the ground. So for somebody who doesn't have that experience yet of owning a business, running a business, what is it about having a business that you even find so rewarding? I have my answer, but I'd love to hear yours. Yeah. Well, first of all, I like the fact that there are no creative limits. I think when you're when you're working for a company or you're working for somebody else, you have to do what they want you to do. And they may accept your ideas and they may take input from you, but you're essentially, you need to, your responsibility is to do what they want you to do and do it well and stay within the structure and the parameters of their business. But when you have your own business, you have free creative license to do whatever you want. You can come up with your own name. You can come up with your own marketing. You can come up with your own logo and branding and and all kinds of things. And I'm just a big, I don't know, I'm always thinking of new ideas and things that I could do. And I know that if I worked, and I have worked in corporate America, by the way, for 17 years, I did. And it was very good experience, but I felt a little stifled. And a lot of times when I had ideas that I took to my boss or manager to people higher up in the company, and they said, oh, that's a nice idea, Steve, we'll think about it. And then they never got around to implementing it. So at a certain point, I thought, you know what, if I'm ever going to do the things that I really want to do in, in business and in life, I'm probably going to have to do them on my own. And so that's, that's one thing I find that, you know, the fact that you have free creative license to do whatever you want, very rewarding. I also, I find it very rewarding to help people, you know, as a copywriter, I've been a full-time copywriter for almost 11 years now. And you know this because you're a copywriter, the words that you write and string together have power and have impact and have influence. And if you're writing words and working with companies and, and working with clients that are doing good work in some way, selling products or services that are valuable, your words are impacting more people to get involved with that and you're improving their life in some way. So that's, I find, kind of neat to be able to have that power, like you alluded to the power of persuasion. I guess more than anything, Steve, I like the idea of being able to work on my terms. There's a lot to be said for corporate structure and corporate America and getting a paycheck every two weeks and having benefits and all those things that are wonderful. But I like working on my terms. I don't necessarily like only having a few weeks of vacation a year. I don't like having to work from eight o'clock to five o'clock. I like working at night. I like working early in the morning. I like working from <laughs> different places. I, a couple of years ago, I spent 10 weeks in the winter. I live in Wisconsin and I wanted to escape the winter. So I went down to Ecuador for 10 weeks and operated my business from Ecuador. And my clients didn't even know that I was down there and it didn't matter to them. So I like being able to work on my terms. So those things, the creative license, being able to help people and being able to work on my terms you know, wherever I want to work from and whenever I want to work. And that's a good point too. And, and we are both writers and we both do coaching and mentoring and that sort of thing, which is a kind of career path that allows us to work wherever. Now, some people might have a brick and mortar store. It doesn't have the same kind of flexibility, but most solopreneurs I've found seem to have paths that are, that might be coaching or it might be information-based or which is, you know, can be writing, can be graphic design. In a sense, that's information-based. You're transmitting a message, and most of this work can be done online. And so you really don't have to be in front of a client face-to-face to to do these things. And I I think sometimes we get this mindset, we have to check into an office. And if you need to check into an office, well, in our office might be Starbucks or (laughs) it'll be a cafe down in, what was it, Quito, uh, Ecuador, I think you're hanging out at. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a a beautiful thing, the world that we live in. And it's just an amazing thing that we can work from anywhere. I was speaking of Starbucks. I was just at Starbucks for a couple hours this morning getting some work done. And I have a couple local coffee shop I hang out at too, but they know me so well at the Starbucks that, you know, all the baristas know me and they treat me well. And I have my own corner spot (laughs) that that I like to have. So it's like my second office, but 
the only rent I pay is the money I spend on coffee. <laughs> That's another perk. Seriously. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you turn from just, I don't want to say just a copywriter, but much more than a copywriter, you have had tremendous influence in the world of writing. And I, I love your online community. It's, it's very positive, very smart, intelligent people involved in the conversations. And I occasionally check in there in your Facebook group and you have a, a wider a community called Cafe Writer. I would love to hear about how did you get started in online communities? What drew you to this? You've also done you know, live meetings. How did this all come about for you? Yeah, so when I first got into copywriting, Actually, I first discovered copywriting back in 2004. So it's been 15 years, but it took about four and a half years before I was able to make the leap into doing it full time. But when I started full time copywriting back in 2009, I knew a number of copywriters. In fact, I think I met you in 2010 or 11, maybe, but I knew copywriters from going to conferences. But the fact is, we work, you know, this, we work by ourselves and it can be a lonely endeavor. We're working in front of our keyboards. <laughs> six, eight, 10, 12 hours a day, whatever it is, but we're working by ourselves. If those of us who work on our own, us solopreneurs, we don't have an office to check into. We don't have colleagues. We don't have coworkers. We don't have a manager. We don't have a boss. And consequently, it can be, not only can it be kind of lonely, but you also don't have that accountability and check-in that you would have if you had a boss and a managerial structure. So I saw a little bit of a gap that I think There were probably some out there, but I wasn't aware of them. But I thought, wouldn't it be cool to have an online community where we could kind of meet a virtual meeting space, so to speak? And I kind of modeled my group, my Facebook group, the Cafe Writer, after the Shakespeare and Company bookstore from back in the 1920s in Paris. Writers and artists and creatives, people like Ernest Hemingway and James Joyce and F. Scott Fitzgerald and people like that would gather at this bookshop not to just sit around and drink coffee and talk, but they would gather to compare notes and check each other's manuscripts and give each other feedback. And so I started Cafe Writer back in 2012 as a place for us writers, copywriters, small business people, solopreneurs to come together and get ideas, advice, encouragement, and feedback from each other in a friendly setting that was not meant to be I didn't start it as a marketing group. I also didn't start it, Steve, as a top-down guru-led business to sell my stuff. I really started it as a true grassroots community. I contacted 40 of my copywriter friends and I said, hey, I'm starting this group. Do you want to join? And we joined. And this was kind of before Facebook groups had gotten big. Now there's hundreds of copywriting and writing Facebook groups, of course. But that's how it started. And it quickly grew. Like you said, we've got a lot of intelligent people. We've got a mix of beginners, intermediates, and seasoned pros. And everybody's just really generous with the ideas and the advice and feedback. And there's, I don't know, it's just a really cool, fun, professional setting. And it's grown quite well and quite steadily since then. So we've been going for, this is our eighth year. And We've got about 9,600 people now, and it's just still very, it's still growing, and it's very active and engaged. On any given month, about 54% of the members are actively involved in some way, checking in, commenting, posting, liking things. So it's an active, fun group. And I just, I really love the idea of building a community, and I have long term plans for it. That's really a big activity level, really, because a lot of larger groups, they get a lot of members, but many of them are just kind of, they kind of skulk in the background or they never visit the group at all. And they have 54% participation rate. That is really huge for an online group these days, I would say. I applaud you because you've put together a platform and an environment that is comfortable for people to interact in. And that takes some skill. And I just wanted to just point out, now we'll have in the show notes, the link to that. So go over and visit Steve's group. I will make sure that's in the show so you can you can visit that. I want to talk a little bit more about your book too. I have it in my hand here. This is the first edition. I understand you have a second edition coming out soon as we have this recording going on. It may even be out by the time this releases, but I wanted to mention the Freelancer Manifesto. And you mentioned about ideas. And I loved that the subtitle is 11 Big Ideas. 11 Big Ideas. You know, that's one of the biggest things you can bring to any business, whether you're working for a client or you're working for yourself to promote a product or a service of your own making. 
ideas are where it's at, but it's not just having an idea. It's taking the idea and running with it, doing something with that idea and not just, you know, thinking about it because ideas are a dime a dozen in a sense until you implement. And so what for you, Steve, caused you to write a book about ideas and, and the freelance for manifesto in the first place? Why did you want to write that book? Well, I wanted to write it, Steve, because well, first of all, I didn't want to write a book about copywriting. I was seeing a lot of books, a lot of programs, a lot of courses about copywriting per se, the craft of copywriting. And that's valuable. That's needed. But I didn't want to write a book like that. I'm a copywriter. I'm a pretty good copywriter, but I actually don't teach people how to write copy. What I do teach people is how to build businesses. And that's based not only on how I built my sales career, but other businesses that I've built too. I had other businesses that I built and grown and, and then in some cases sold. I had a lawn care business, for example, for six years that I built up. I, I was going to let my sons inherit it, but they didn't have any interest in it. So I sold it, <laughs> but I built it up to quite a successful level. My wife has a mural painting business and I have been instrumental in helping her build her mural painting business. But what I wanted to do is write a book about doing things a little differently. I was seeing a lot of people copy, do things the same way. And a lot of people in my world of copywriting were trying to build their business by the kind of the same way that everybody else was doing it by hanging out their virtual shingle, waiting for job boards to post jobs and gigs for copywriters or someone to advertise that they needed a copywriter. And that's certainly one way to build a business or to grow as a copywriter but it's mostly what I call the freelancer for hire or the copywriter for hire model. And again, that's great. And I know people that make, you know, hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars a year doing that. So it's it can be very lucrative. But I wanted to help people go from working and building other people's businesses to building a business of their own. And so this book kind of squashes some of the myths that are out there about building businesses. I kind of dispel some of the ideas that freelancing is fun and easy and anybody can do it and all these things that I was also hearing at the time a few years back. And then when I got into the whole business, you know, I thought that it was going to be easy and it was going to be fun. And I was just going to sit on the beach for a few hours every day and tap away at my keyboard and make tons of money right away. And so I wanted to show people the reality of freelancing and not actually in a way to almost scare people off from it. Because I think a lot of people were coming into it a little bit delusional and a little bit, and I was myself in the very beginning, I wanted to let people know, hey, here's, yes, working for yourself can be very rewarding. It can be very lucrative. It can be very substantial. But here's the reality. It isn't easy. Not anyone can do it. You do need some skills. It's going to take time. And so the first part of my book, I call the dark side of freelancing. I kind of paint a dark picture, but I paint the reality. And maybe it has scared a few people off, but I'd rather have that than people come into it with rose colored glasses. But then in the second part, the bright side of freelancing, that's where I talk about the 11 big ideas to stand out and thrive in today's crowded marketplace. And I say crowded marketplace, every marketplace is crowded. If there's opportunity to make money, there's going to be a lot of people coming into it. And that's fine. I welcome competition. I think it's great that there's a lot of people doing what I do. But it also means that we have to stand out in some way so that clients can see how we're different than everybody else. And that's a big thing that I try to help people do in my group, in my Facebook group, and in my private group, is to help them stand out and be different and do things in a different way than everybody else's. And that's a well-taken point, too. I also came into this with this bright idea of what I wanted to do. And I've had that since I was a kid. I mean, my parents were in Amway, and I listened to the motivational tapes, like, religiously. While they were, like, at meetings, I'd be at home, you know, vacuuming the floor listening to a motivation tape. Well, motivation is great, but you've got to actually do something. And went through several business failures because I come into this idea of this is going to be quick and easy. And quick and easy is really the vast exception. You do have to work if you want to build something of value that lasts. You might get a quick hit on something, but the truth is, if you want something worthwhile that people are going to pay you for, you're going to have to put in the work. And that work is building the skill set 
and providing something of value to somebody that is worth an exchange of value, which is the money they're paying you. And so that's just part of normal business. Now, it doesn't mean that it's, but like what you said, you had balance there because there is many great benefits of having your own business, but don't come into it thinking, oh, I'm just going to sit on the beach. If I'm going to sit on a beach, I'm not working most of the time. I'm going to be out there playing with my kids or something. And, and speaking of kids, you talk a lot about your children too. And people are like, we all brag on our kids, right? But you have some really special children. Tell us a little bit about them. Thank you. So my wife and I have four kids. And actually, as of four months ago, they're all out of the house. So we're officially empty nesters now. My two daughters went off to school out east. I live in Wisconsin, but we have four kids and they're, they range from 16 to 23. So my oldest son is just out of school and he's an actor in Hollywood. My second son will be graduating from the University of Wisconsin in May and he's an editor. Even though he's going to school and he's getting a degree in creative writing, but he's actually a little bit of an entrepreneur himself. <laughs> and he's an entertainer and a dancer and a singer. And my daughter's just started school. My youngest one is only 16, but she's actually in college out at Williams College out east. And my other daughter's in art school. So they all have an entrepreneurial bent. And I think that came from my wife and I. So I'm a writer, copywriter. My wife is an artist. But to back up a little bit, I'm glad you asked this question because the reason I got into copywriting and working for myself in the first place is because the corporate structure, the job, I had a great job. I wasn't running away from a job. I made good money, had a great company, just everything, you know, things were great. I could have kept going along that way. At the time when I got into this full time, almost 11 years ago, my kids were five, seven, nine, 12, whatever at that age. And I was starting to realize that if I didn't do something different, I was going to miss out on a little bit of their childhood. I was already starting to miss some of their practices and their games and their rehearsals and their plays and their concerts just because of the, the work that I had. And so a big reason that I wanted to work for myself was so that I could spend more time with my kids and do things on my terms. So I structured my business in my life to kind of for a few years, especially in the beginning, to really work around my kids' schedule. So I did a lot of work at night in the wee hours of the morning, getting up early so that I could do things when they were, my youngest daughter wasn't in school yet and the other kids were in school, but I volunteered in the classrooms for like six or seven years. Every week I would spend an hour in each of their classrooms and help the teachers grade papers and stuff like that. And I was usually the only dad in the class because <laughs> all the other dads were working regular jobs, but it was really cool. And the other thing is that we were able from a young age, when the kids were young, we were able to do some extended travel that I wouldn't have been able to do if I had continued working in corporate America. So for example, actually 10 years ago this month, we spent three weeks in my wife's home country of Nigeria. I wouldn't have been able to do that. We took the kids out of school actually for a couple of weeks, but I wouldn't have been able to do that if I had been working my regular job where I only got two weeks of vacation a year and it had to be spread out over two different weeks and all that kind of stuff. But so we were able to spend time in Nigeria with my wife's family. A year and a half later, we spent a month in Ecuador in the summer. Three years later, we spent the entire summer in Ecuador. So the day after the kids were out of school in 2014, we left for Ecuador and didn't come back till a week before school started. So we spent the entire summer in Ecuador and just those trips, you know, just, it really had an impact on the kids and it just really made some lasting memories, but it also instilled in them a desire to travel. And that's why they're <laughs> part of the reason why they're now spread out all over the country. But it also watching my wife and I do our businesses over the years, got them thinking that, Hey, we can do our own thing too. So they all have a little bit of an entrepreneurial bent and I think growing up, especially in the early days when we first started our businesses, I think they thought that everybody worked like that and everybody worked from home and <laughs> they never really saw us drive to a job. They saw us working at home and I think they thought everybody did that, but now they're realizing that's not the case. But in any case, it's had a good effect on them. It's had a good long-term effect on them. Yeah, I credit my parents the same way, even though I didn't have a successful self-business career until a little bit of time before we met, about 2009, when I went full-time copywriting, it was the foundation principles you learn from your parents and what you see 
And I hope to instill those same values in my kids. I have seven kids and they're growing up and some of them are very entrepreneurial in nature. You know, if they want to have extra money, go shovel a driveway. We got two feet of snow this week, for example. Go shovel a driveway, you can make some money. You know, go rake a lawn, whatever. Don't just ask mom and dad for a handout. They've yeah. learned the principle of work equals reward. And that's a principle that you can take and, and live with. That's very important in life. And I'm glad that you're doing that. And you're showing, I know it's funny you say, but you know, it, it sounded almost like you were almost apologetically saying you had to take your kids two weeks out of school, but fantastic life experience that trains or teaches so much more than you can get in the classroom. You know, how many yeah. kids get to go to Nigeria for three weeks? I mean, that's awesome. Yes. It was at the time I thought, yeah, is this right? Is this good taking them out of school? But it turned out very well. And the teachers were all very cool. Our kids actually went to a charter school and it was just very, we had a good relationship. And actually, interestingly, since it's been a long time now, since they've been in elementary school, but we've stayed in really close contact. And to this day, we're still good friends with a lot of the teachers and I'm good friends with the principal and still get together for coffee once a month. So it was all good. And the the teachers actually, actually, they kind of respected that. And they thought a couple of them commented, wow, that's really cool, you know, that you guys are able to do that. So they didn't mind at all. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. And and speaking of travel, and you have turned travel into a business as well. I saw recently, I know you're doing something down in Ecuador where you you spend a lot of time at and you're helping people enjoy Ecuador. Tell us about that. Yes. So I first discovered Ecuador 2011, went down there. I just, I'd heard about it and I wanted to go. So I took the kids and we spent a month down there and then I came back, spent the whole summer in 2014. And then I was down there for 10 weeks in 2016, writing my book. But I really, I fell in love with Ecuador. I've traveled all quite a few places. I've been to 34 countries, but I keep going back to Ecuador again and again. I just really love it. It's the land of eternal spring. And so I love the weather. The people are friendly. I speak Spanish. It's a beautiful country. It's one of the most biodiverse places on the planet. So I've really fallen in love with Ecuador. But so much so that I would always be talking it up and I would tell people about it. And people would always say, Oh, I'd love to go there. But, you know, it was just a little bit out of people's comfort zones to do on their own, even though I gave them advice and what to do and stuff. So a couple of years ago, I thought, you know what? I'm going to organize a tour and see if people, if, if they don't want to go by themselves, maybe they'll come with me. If I organize the tour and I plan it, and I hire a driver and transportation, and I set up the hotels and do all the organizing. So that's what I did. So I have a website, it's EcuadorExcursion.com. And in 2018, we did the first trip, we did another one last year, but the first year we had 14 people last year, we had 16 people. And I didn't, it's just a, it's a 10 day trip. I just do it once a year, because it's not my full time business. It's just, it's just a side thing, but it, it might grow into more. But it was fun. And so I organized the whole thing. So I played tour operator and people asked me, well, did you have to, you know, did you have to train to be a tour guide or a tour operator? Do you have to get special permission from the government of Ecuador to do this? Or do you have to have a business license to do this? And the answer to all those questions is no, (laughs) I just did it. I just built a website. I spread the word. I actually don't even advertise. This is one business. I don't spend any money advertising. It's all word of mouth. And people sign up and they pay to go on this trip. And so I make a little bit of money and I get to travel for free. But more than anything, I get to share my love of my adopted home country of Ecuador with other people and get away. So every July, I spend the month in Ecuador and the tour is 10 days and I spend a little extra time down there by myself. And long term, my wife and I actually have plans to buy an apartment or a house down there. And maybe split our time half and half, spend half the time in the United States, half the time down in Ecuador. That's awesome. And I just want to encourage people, if if you want to do some traveling, go take a look at Steve's website. It'll be in the show notes. I want to kind of come back around to strictly business a bit more. You talk about the gig economy in your book, and I know you talk about it a lot because it's out there. But let me just ask you straightforward. What are your thoughts on this whole idea of a gig economy? What is, is it good? Is it bad? What do you think about how people should approach this? I think the gig economy is phenomenal. I love it. It allows a lot of people to do a lot of things that they wouldn't be able to do otherwise. So for example, I know there's a lot of elements to the gig economy and some people think of it strictly as, hey, you can drive for Uber or do Airbnb. And those that's one part of it. And I know a lot of people that while they do their full-time job, they're doing driving for Uber on the side. For example, last year when I was out in Vermont, I got a Uber from the airport to my 
bed and breakfast, which was about 45 minutes away. And the guy that picked me up was a middle school English teacher. And he had been only driving for Uber for a few months, but he had already given like 500 rides or something like that. And he was making, you know, a couple thousand dollars a month or whatever. I don't know exactly what it was, but he was making good extra money on the side driving for Uber. So it opens the doors to a lot of people, but there's a lot more to the gig economy than just driving for Uber or, you know, driving for Uber Eats or delivering or things like that, or having an Airbnb. That's great. You can be a writer, you can be a designer, you can do a lot of things on the side. It seems like these days, <laughs> it seems like almost half the people I know have some kind of side, a lot of people call it a side hustle. So they might be, they might have their full-time work and then on the weekends, they're doing photography shoots or they're doing videography for weddings or they're a graphic designer or whatever it is. You can do a lot of things. If you have an expertise, if you have a skill, you can put it out there to the marketplace, do it in your own time. I know a guy across the street from me, he builds websites for people. He has a full-time job, but he makes good money on the side building websites for people. So all kinds of things. So I think it's great. And there's a low barrier to entry to the gig economy. But the drawback to that is that it also is very crowded. And it can be hard if you just follow the way everybody else is doing it. It can be hard to really make inroads and make good money. And it can be hard for the clients, the customers to discern like who's good and who's not. Like, for example, if they're looking for a graphic designer or a copywriter, there's since so many people can jump into the fray and hang out their virtual shingle and put up the website and be in the gig economy. It's sometimes hard for clients to figure out who's good, who's not. Is this person going to do the right thing? So somehow you have to stand out. And you have to do things a little different. That's kind of what my whole book is about, is standing out and doing things different. So I talk a lot about personal branding and really making sure that people understand who you are. People aren't just hiring what you have for sale, your services or your products, but in large part, they're hiring you and the feeling that they get from hiring you and the feeling that they get that you're going to do a good job. So personal branding is a big part of it. Marketing yourself and connecting with people that you want to work with instead of waiting for people to contact you. A lot of people just think, hey, if I just hang out my virtual shingle, my website, I'll just kind of sit back and wait for people to contact me and then I'll connect with them and I'll have work. I recommend kind of flipping that model. And the way I look at it is if people come to you, that's a bonus. That's great. And I get, I do get inbound leads and I get people come to me by word of mouth and things like that, referrals. But I count all that as bonus. The way I teach in my group and with the people I work with individually and in my private group is that we should really make a a list. I call it a hot 150 of people that we would, people in businesses that we really want to work with, a targeted list of people that we've made the decision, hey, this is a cool business that I would like to work with. Make this list and really put some time and thought into it. And then go about, and there's a lot of ways to do this. I won't go into all the detail, but then go about systematically connecting with those people where you make the first effort and you contact them. And then you do what I call the sifting and sorting and decide, okay, who's a good fit, who's not. And you bring them into your world instead of waiting for someone to contact you and going into their world. So it's a little different approach, but overall, I love it. I think the gig economy is great. And you've probably seen the statistics, Steve, that. There was some reports a few years ago that by the year 2020, 40% of workers were going to be in some way, shape, or form in the gig economy, working for themselves, driving for Uber, doing something on a freelance basis. And I don't know if we're there yet, 40% of the workforce, but I have a feeling it's getting there and it's going to keep growing. Yeah, it's growing for sure. I mean, my son, you know, I've got a Three boys now that all work at Chick-fil-A. It's funny. Uh, they all work at the same place. And one of them actually drives for DoorDash as well. So he's kind of already participating in the gig economy. Does it on the side to make a little extra money when he wants to. And so that's that's always a good way to uh, look at, you know, here's how way I can make some extra money. But I like what you said about separating yourself from the crowd. And you do that when you reach out because many people who are participating in the gig economy are reliant upon like an app, like you're going to do DoorDash or Uber or what have you and hope that that flows in. But you promote the Hot 150 model, which is going out to others. 
And the reason I'm bringing this up because I had a question in mind that I, I think a lot of listeners will have. When you reach out to somebody else, you have to make that first move. How do you tell people to make that connection? How do you introduce yourself and make that first step into an inroad to a potential client? How would you introduce yourself? And I know it's going to vary by business, obviously, but you know, right. what, is there a general way you would handle that? Yes. The tip of the, certainly, as you know, there's, there's a lot of ways you can do it. And I'm, for one, I'm very active on social media, Facebook in particular, a little bit on LinkedIn, a little bit on Instagram, not very much on Twitter and Pinterest and stuff like that. So certainly you can connect with people by social media. And that seems to be the default way that most people do it. A lot of people that I see on Facebook and my group and just watching them interact with people and hearing the way they talk about their businesses a lot of people think that social media is the way to connect with people. So you join groups, you connect with people, you connect with people behind the scenes by Facebook Messenger, things like that. You do LinkedIn connecting, LinkedIn messaging, things like that, LinkedIn marketing. Those are all valid ways for sure. Email marketing, cold email marketing, warm email marketing, whatever you want to call it. So, you know, certainly social media, email, but I'm a big fan of direct mail a huge fan of direct mail. It still works. Now, this may not apply to everybody in your audience because it depends on the country. For example, when I'm in Ecuador, there is no good postal system in Ecuador. So direct mail would not work in Ecuador. Canada, it can be a little bit expensive, but I do know this in the United States. So anybody that's operating in the United States, or at least if your clients are here, you don't even have to be in the United States to take advantage of this. But if you have clients in the United States or an audience in the United States, Direct mail is still here. It still works and it's still a very, it can be a very profitable and a very good way to connect with people because it stands out. I'll give you an example. So recently I sent out a hundred, so I I do this myself. So I'm taking my own advice, my hot 150 system. I have something that I'm promoting that's starting in January and I made a list of 150 people and it took me a while to do this because I was kind of selective about who I wanted to send this to. And instead of just sending them a number 10 business size envelope with a 50 cent stamp or whatever it is now, I decided, you know what? I really want to stand out. I want to make sure they get this and I want to make sure it makes an impression. And so I went to the post office and I got 150 priority mail envelopes, 150 priority mail labels, 150 priority mail tracking labels. And then 150 priority mail stamps. You can actually buy the pre-made stamps for $7.35. So someone might think, well, gosh, that's a lot of money, Steve. Yeah, it kind of is, I guess. Um, (laughs) I spent $1,102. I remember the amount. That's how much it was, $1,102.50, I think, on this campaign. And I'm I'm still waiting to see the results because I just did this. But I have a feeling it's going to pay off and the 150 people that get this priority mail envelope instead of just a regular envelope or just an email or a Facebook message, it's going to stand out. And I know it does because I sent one a couple of weeks ago to somebody in my group and it made such an impression that he wrote a whole Facebook post about it. I saw (laughs) that actually. I didn't see that. So it makes an impression, it stands out and people remember you. So that's one way. And I advocate doing that as a first step. And then you may be following up. You don't have to do that every time you connect with someone that could get expensive, but it's a good introductory way that stands out. And then you can circle back to them and connect with them by email, connect with them on Facebook, by LinkedIn. I do recommend not a, I don't know what you'd call it, you know, just the spray and the spray method of just putting a whole lot of marketing out there and putting out huge numbers of like sending out 10,000 emails or whatever, you know, it was a spray and pray. I think they call it (laughs) Yeah, spray and pray approach, but I'm just much more of a, I don't think you have to have, and this, maybe this applies to people in your audience. So people that think, well, gosh, I don't have a list. I don't have an organic house email list of 5,000 people yet. I'm growing and I want to get there, but I don't have an email list yet. I don't have a following on Instagram. I don't have a following on Facebook. How am I going to do this? This, I'm telling you, this is a way for anybody, even if you're just starting out, even if you're an unknown, if you just are starting your business now and nobody even knows who you are, you can do this approach. Yes, it does cost a little bit of money in the beginning. Yes, it does take a little bit of time and it does take follow-up. But I think if you take 150 prospects or so 
and then contact them in a good way with a good direct response marketing piece. But then the, the, you follow that up and you circle back and you nurture that relationship. So many people are just contacting people once or twice and then they're moving on to someone else. I'm in the relationship business and I'm in the, I'm in the business of building relationships and making connections with people. And that's how I built my career. Some people are surprised at this, but over the last 10 and a half years of being a full-time copywriter, I have had less than a hundred clients and people are like, what? I have a hundred clients a year. How do you do that over 11 years? Well, I've had a lot of clients that stuck with me month after month after month. And I did the same. And I know you operate this way too. Exactly. That I've had a lot of long-term steady clients. You don't need to have tons of clients. You don't need to do mass marketing. So if you take a smaller list, you nurture it, you develop relationships, you make connections, you have good client conversations, you can build a business this way. And it's, it's something that anybody can do from scratch. Now, in other countries where maybe direct mail doesn't work the same way as it does in the United States, you can do something similar with 150 people, maybe connecting with them in a different way. But I believe that this stands out. It works. You have to have a good offer. You have to have a good service or product. You have to do things in the right way. There's a lot of moving parts to this, but it's not as complicated as it might seem. And you don't need to go down the route of complicated Facebook ads and funnels and all that kind of stuff. That if you do that and you're into that and you and you want to go down that road, that can be a very great that can be a great way to build your business too. But for someone that either doesn't understand that world or doesn't want to get involved in it or just wants to do things different than everybody else, this is another way to do it. Or it's a nice complement to Facebook ads. I'm running Facebook ads. I'll be doing this in the next couple of weeks. I'll be running Facebook ads to drive people to my page for my book. I'm going to be offering a free book. You know, if you, you just pay the shipping and I'm going to send you for $6.95, I'll send you my $20 book in the mail. And that's going to be my offer. But then I'll have things that people can take advantage of if they want beyond that too. And now I'm trying to think what your original question was. Well, no, I, I, it was about how you get, you know, make your entry into, com- into a company when you're reaching out to a client. I think it was a fantastic answer. Very well thought out. I appreciate that. You know, you, if you want to stand out, you have to do something different. And it used to be direct mail was king. And it's like everybody is talking about the web these days. And, and of course, the web is huge. It opened up a global economy in a way we've never seen in history before. But direct mail is not used as much, which means it stands out more. So I love that tip you gave our audience. So thank you for that. And I know we're running low on time here. I really appreciate your time, Steve, on the, on the call today. Any last words of advice for our audience based on what we've talked about so far? Yeah, a couple things. First of all, just to tag on to the last point about standing out, you know, it is hard to stand out in today's economy. One thing that I recommend to everybody, whatever your expertise is, whatever your, and one of the things that I try to do with my cafe group and when I'm working with people individually is, I am trying to help people become what I call recognized experts in their little corner of the world. You don't have to become a, you know, a nationally known name. You don't have to spend tens of thousands of dollars a month on Facebook ads so that everybody knows you. I want to help people, solopreneurs, I want to help people become recognized experts in their little corner of the world. But I think one of the best ways to do that, Steve, is to write a book a physical book. Now, I know a lot of people have reports, special reports that they've written or eBooks, and those are great. That's a great place to start. And that can be a great lead generation tool. But I went to a conference earlier this year, one of the biggest marketing conferences in the country, Traffic and Conversion Summit out in San Diego, put on by digital marketer Ryan Dice and those people. Great conference, by the way. And speaker after speaker got up on stage and said, In today's economy, in 2019 and going into the 2020s and beyond, the best way to generate leads in this economy, bar none, is to have a physical book. I heard speaker after speaker get up on stage and say that. And I was happy to hear that because I've written a book. But I also know that this is true. Whether For anybody, for your audience, it, it helps you build credibility. It helps you build authority. But it's a way to generate leads. I had a meeting at a coffee shop just last week with somebody who's a physical therapist. One of the reasons she's built a really big physical therapy practice is because she's written a book. 
And people know her as this recognized expert. Somebody else I know, actually, they're in my cafe group that works with dentists. Well, they wrote a book on how dentists can improve their marketing. The whole book is about dental marketing. So they wrote a book to their audience showing dentists how to do marketing. Now, some of those dentists will choose to do it themselves. Some of them will choose to do it through them. So it's a way to generate leads. But that would be one point. Just a couple other things. And then we'll, I know we got to wrap up, but so writing a book, but I would just say, find something that if you can find the convergence, and I know this sounds kind of cliche, but if you can find the convergence of something that you enjoy doing, that you're really enthusiastic about, and that also fills a need and that fills a gap in the marketplace, that's what you should do. Or do, or do something that other people maybe aren't willing to do or don't want to do or aren't as good at as you. And this, this takes a little bit of thought and reflection. I think the normal reflex when people go into business is they see a course on something like, hey, how to be a copywriter, or how to do this, or how to do this. And they jump into something without putting a whole lot of thought into it. My recommendation is to, to kind of take a step back and really do some some self-evaluation of your skills, of your interests, of your background, of your experience, of just everything, taking stock of who you are and what maybe going beyond that, maybe even what, you know, what feeds your soul and what you find rewarding. And if you can find that thing that kind of meets all those criteria that fills a gap in the marketplace, that there's a demand for, that you're good at, that you enjoy, and that you're passionate about, then you know, just find a, find a mentor, find someone to help you. And you can ride that. You can ride that for five or 10 years. I want to help people find something that they can not, not just do now and do for a year or two, but I want to help people find that thing that they can ride for the next five to 10 years. So they don't have to keep pivoting every couple of years. So those are a couple, I guess, last pieces of advice that I would give anybody, no matter what, what your expertise is. Yeah, that's great. I want to share a couple of thoughts on what you just said too. You know, there was a book a long time ago, it was called Do What You Love and the Money Will Follow. But, but what you said is more accurate because you have to fill a need in the marketplace if you want to make any money. So do what you love that fills a need. So somebody will pay you to do what you need, <laughs> what they need. So that's great. And I love what you said about the books too. And that's one of my big goals. And it was a goal of this year that did not get accomplished this year. It sat in the back burner too long. But I started my own local meetup. I'll probably talk about that one of my solo episodes coming up for writing and just having a specified time to write every week. But writing a book, you know, it's, it's neat. I had a uh, guest on, Dr. Corinne Wheeler. I think it's her aunt, is uh, Olivia Newton-John. And she did not parlay Olivia Newton-John into getting on TV. But what she did is she wrote a book. And then before the book was even published, she's getting offers to get on television around the United States about her book, No More Meds. She's a chiropractor. She has a mission to get a million children off of unnecessary medications. And she didn't even publish a book before she's getting on media, television, radio, and podcast. And Olivia Newton-John's coming to her, her aunt said, how are you doing this? How are you get on TV? <laughs> so book is really powerful. So absolutely, I'm going to back up what you heard at Traffic and Conversion Summit. Absolutely. Uh, that's something that I've been negligent on is not taking care of that book yet. So that, that's on my burner. I've got an outline, but I've got to finish the draft so I can get it into the world and then help some more people with it. Very Steve, cool. it's been wonderful having you on today. Thank you so much for joining me. Where can people find out more about you and find your community at? Yeah, so first of all, my community, it's a free Facebook group. It's called Cafe Writer. If you look on Facebook, just look up Cafe Writer. It's a growing community. It's free. It's And there's a lot of helpful advice there. So that I would recommend that for sure. You know, if you want help, it isn't just for writers, even though in spite of the name Cafe Writer, it's for really any creative professional, solopreneur, small business owner, who wants to use their talents to build a business. So for certainly the Facebook group, um, my book, The Freelancer Manifesto, the second edition will be coming out soon um, in the next couple of weeks. The first one is on Amazon. So The Freelancer Manifesto, 11 Big Ideas to Stand Out and Thrive. People can find me at Cafe Writer. That's my website. And I have probably a couple hundred blog posts. So again, a lot of free information. So there's a lot of free stuff there. If anybody wants my ebook that I wrote called 47 Ways to Do Copywriting. If anyone's a copywriter and wants to figure out how to position themselves a little bit differently, I have an ebook called 47 Ways to Do Copywriting. And if you just shoot me an email, steve at cafewriter.com, I'll, I'll send you that for free. And then my this is a, a different business, but as we talked about my Ecuador tour business, if anyone's looking at going to 
Ecuador, whether it's with me or on your own, I've got a lot of good advice for people that are going to Ecuador, even on your own, at my website, EcuadorExcursion.com. Terrific, Steve. Thank you so much for being on today. Hey, thank you for having me, Steve. And I'd love to talk again sometime. And uh, best wishes to you and to everyone listening. Thank you for listening to the Solopreneur Success Podcast. We hope you discovered valuable advice on how to start and grow your own successful solopreneur business. If you liked the podcast, you'll love the all-new Solopreneur Success Connections community at solopreneurcoach.com. Here you'll get exclusive access to our private, members-only community of business builders, free business building resources, and live online monthly training designed to accelerate your business success. Join us now at solopreneurcoach.com. Hey, solopreneurs, it's Steve Combs again. You can find the show notes for this episode at solopreneurcoach.com forward slash 016. If you found this episode helpful, be sure to share it with someone you know. And thank you for listening.